the idea of handcraft and artisanality which is embedded into our living heritage. So it's really important for us to be able to continuously examine why are we doing what we are doing, to stick to the process and believe that the end result, the outcome will be truly what, where we want to be. Could we give back to the land as much as we took to, from it ecologically? So ladies and gentlemen, we have with us none other than Amrish Arora. So let's have a huge, huge round of applause. Today I'm going to grapple with, along with all of you, with some of the questions uh, that our studio is grappling with and something I've personally been grappling with, what is sustainability for a country like India, right? which I've come to understand over time has its own specific challenges. It has 17 of the world's 29 agroclimatic zones. So the only two countries in the world that have more agroclimatic zones are China and the USA with 30 each, but they are three times the landmass. So this is the highest density of agroclimatic zones in the world. This diversity has shown up over the past several centuries through the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the homes we build, each unique to its context, whether the porous ventilated structures and clothes in the tropical humid Kerala with buttermilk to cool us down, or the insulated homes with small windows and yak wool clothes of Ladakh coupled with the salted butter tea to keep the skin supple and warm. And yet we have programmed ourselves for homogenization our food, our clothing, and in turn, our standards for cooling. We would like it 18 degrees inside when it's 42 degrees outside so that we can wear our suits. Our buildings have started to look similar across various continents, countries, and cultures. And Gandhi saw this coming, but could not stop the starry-eyed draw of industrialization, which we all continue to get sucked into the price of which we are all paying today. The question is, what option do we have as we look to the West for our aspirations? Do we have enough within, in our past, in our current moment, to create the future we need for ourselves? With this belief, we at the studio have been asking ourselves over the years, how should we build how can we build so that we can sustain not only the environment, but also our unique socio-cultural fabric? For example, can we do more with less? Cool lesser, for instance. We discovered the changing standards of adaptive thermal comfort allow for different measures for different environments for example, an office that is naturally ventilated and passively cooled, sensibly designed, will save 70% energy against an equivalent lead platinum rated fully air conditioned building with triple glazing, the most efficient air conditioning systems and all the technologies that you need for sustainability to shine in the current rating systems. In this project for a government office, which is in Orissa, uh, called the Krishi Bhavan, which has gotten known more for its facade and its craft narrative. We used a night purging natural system with passive design principles. So the air gets sucked into the building through the north facade at night when the temperatures drop. It gets trapped into the building in the day once the temperatures rise and there are fans within the building. So the whole building is a heat sink that cools down the atmosphere through the day. And again, the vents open once the temperatures start to drop. So as a result, we've managed getting uh, EPI of 31, which is one third that of the Griha Green Building Challenge of 2030, which the government has set. And achieved ambient temperatures, as you can see on the table on the right, 
well within ASHRAE standards of adaptive thermal comfort, which are the new norms being followed globally, as we understand that thermal comfort is not a constant. Thermal comfort in Mumbai will be different from what thermal comfort is in London, which will be different from what it is in Rajasthan. And we need to start to be able to recognize that and design for that. And we have enough evidence of structures that do that successfully. Can we do more with less? Can we condition lesser area? Do we really need to condition every single space? We become so obsessed with comfort and comfort itself defined through a standard that we stopped asking these questions. So this is a new campus we did for the Royal Enfield. It's a, the headquarters in Chennai, which uh, all of you know is a warm and humid climate similar to that of Mumbai, where the campus is de designed around green courtyards 30 to 35 percent of the areas, such as the circulation and breakout spaces, are fan cooled and non air conditioned. And three years into use, the users love it. And these outdoor spaces are extensively used as a relief from the boxed in air conditioned areas. Similarly, the School of Leadership in Rajasthan, that's under construction, and a university in Odisha, where only 20 percent of the spaces are air conditioned, which need to be because of equipment or other such reasons. A museum in Hyderabad for the Aga Khan Trust, a competition that we won at the Kutub, for the Kutub Shahi Gardens, is sunk into the ground with green roofs requiring only the artifact galleries to be air conditioned. All these projects achieve thermal comfort at energy levels well beyond any rating standard for fully air conditioned buildings. Can we reuse what we have? Can we build only when we really need to? So uh, this is a project where a client came to us in Jaipur and uh, she wanted a jewelry store. And this was a structure that already existed. And she said that, look, why don't you bring this structure down and build me a new building? Because I don't like the way this was built. And we proposed to her not to bring the structure down and chose to retain and repurpose and reshape so that she got a store that is beyond something she imagined an existing structure could give her. Or for the Mehrangar Fort Visitor Center, another competition that we won with the idea of forward circularity. So they were facing a unique problem where they were having to break down old structures and build new structures as the needs of the museum changed. We proposed a building made of metal and local sandstone totally in dry construction, bolted together without cement or glue that could be reshaped, modified as functions change over time. This is under construction and during the process of construction, the design has changed a couple of times as new technologies have been brought in and we've been able to modify the building ongoingly. Last but not the least, the idea of handcraft and artisanality, which is embedded into our living heritage. The Ras Jodhpur Hotel, which some of you might be familiar with, what a lot of people don't know that the original intent of the facade was to use motifs that were derived, traditional motifs that were derived from the neighboring buildings. And we realized while designing the building that our intent, which involved moving shutters in stone, could only be achieved if we were water jet cutting these jalis in the thickness we wanted. The craftsmen said they cannot cut these kind of patterns in the 20 millimeter stone thickness that we wanted. We wanted to be true to the authenticity of the process and the craftsmanship. So we changed the design, worked with the craftsmen and came up with a facade and an option that they could achieve by hand. A decision that served us well and what we found over time, a big reason why we push the handmade is the inherent embodied energy of the process, which actually is nothing but food grown, which actually consumes carbon dioxide. And the machinery used is just a tiny bit of metal of a hammer, a chisel, or some hand tools versus industrial processes, which are very often used to achieve an aesthetic of what we call Indian but at its soul, it's industrial. 
So it's really important for us to be able to continuously examine why are we doing what we are doing, to stick to the process and believe that the end result, the outcome, will be truly what, where we want to be, rather than try and imagine an end result and try and find processes to achieve a visual aesthetic or a pretense of being true to our culture. Uh, this is a really interesting project. I've just included it to show how different craft can be interpreted. So these are miniature artists. So miniature artists in Rajasthan, this is the same store, the jewelry store that we're doing in Jaipur. And these are different frescoes being done in, in different rooms. And these guys, so these are vaulted ceilings. And they've never worked on anything but paper. It took them about three months to perfect the technique. They had to work in reverse, which they're not used to. They had to work in an extended perspective because of the curved ceilings. But they were so excited by the whole kind of process and the collaboration that today we have something, uh, I think in a, in, a, in a few months, this project should be done in a couple of months, something that we are all really proud of and it's entirely, they have found a new way to interpret their craft and, and, and take it forward. So in short, uh, I mean, these are just some examples of the kind of questions we've been grappling with and how we've tried to interpret them across regions in different parts of the country and even sometimes beyond our borders. So the key questions, just to sum it up, that we are asking is frugal innovation, doing more with less, looking at low-tech passive means, which for a country like ours is critical for more and more people to have access to sustainable methodologies, adapting and reusing at every moment where we have a chance, asking clients, even if they have a mandate to bring something down, whether there's a possibility of reusing, designing buildings that endure, both in terms of beauty and material, redefining luxury. A lot of us get appointed, appointed by people who want to set luxury benchmarks. If we start using ordinary materials that are elevated through the idea of craft and local materials, then it gives us a chance to change the benchmarks of what luxury is. I'm going to go into detail into two projects to walk you through how you know, all of this comes together uh, from the start to the finish. It's not really, you know, where we, where we break it down to these, to these aspects, uh, but it's more seamless. And these are uh, two small projects built in two different regions, one in the mountains and one in Rajasthan. In both, we had a brilliant set of collaborators, Manjunath from Bangalore for structure, Akshay Kaul was a landscape architect, Buildcraft India was the contractor for construction and finishing, and Mangrove Collective did the furniture for these projects. The first project has been a journey of watching nature heal the land as much as us building a home. Situated between Bhimtal and Mukteshwar in the Kumau region of Uttarakhand, the site is at a height of 2,000 meters above sea level. It rises through an elevation of 400 meters over an incline of a kilometer with slopes varying from 25 to 40 degrees. The hills around Delhi have become an attractive destination for a growing market of second homes, which has led to rampant, insensitive construction by private developers looking to make a quick buck, made worse by the lack of building code in rural areas. The region has abundant rainfall, but the breakdown of traditional rainwater catchment systems has led to a scarcity of water, destabilization of slopes, and destruction of green cover, making it increasingly prone to landslides and, flood, and floods, as most of you have been reading. So when our client approached us with the idea of doing a luxury hillside development, we were very wary of taking it on, not wanting to be part of the destruction of yet another hill. However, over several meetings, we found that our client was a nature lover, he shared our values, and we jointly set ourselves a mandate. Could we give back to the land as much as we took to, from it ecologically? Could we tread very lightly on the ground and perhaps even enrich the existing ecosystem? For the master planning exercise, we worked with Akshay Kaul. We started the analysis of the slopes, surface drainage patterns, vegetation, and the intersection of these, which showed us the least ecologically disruptive zones for construction and infrastructure hubs. Following through with a road network that worked in sync with the terrain, this generated a master plan with less than 70 homes to be built over the next few years, 
spread over 88 acres of land, giving us less than 5% ground coverage on the site. Keeping the construction light and sparse, we planned greater shared community spaces, forests and amenities, rather than large private ones, and amortized the cost among the house owners. We created a goal to be net surplus on our water requirements through rainwater alone, a first in the region. For the first two years, the only work that happened at site was on ecological regeneration. To reduce surface runoff and minimize soil erosion, a network of dry stone masonry gully plugs was made. So far, more than 300 of these have been finished. And within just three seasons of rainfall, water levels in the shallow wells on site and even in the villages downstream, outside our site, has gone up to levels not seen in the past two decades. To prevent soil erosion and stabilize the land along steeper gradients, we adopted the use of bioengineering techniques such as brush layering, hydro seeding, and bamboo crib walls. The site has been and continues to be reforested with thousands of native trees such as oak, rhododendron, along with native shrubs and grasses. Infrastructure is being planned as a distributed hub and spoke network. Rainwater runoff from the roofs will be collected and supplied through a gravity-fed network of tanks with a capacity to hold 50 lakh liters of water when the homes are built out. Wastewater is biologically treated and reused for flushing, gardening, and horticulture. The villa in the woods, which I will show now, is the first home on the site within a clearing of oak trees with a slope of 40 degrees, almost unbuildable by traditional methods of construction. The 450 square meter villa was designed to be built in a manner that both the process of construction and the end product have a minimal impact on the terrain with no trees being cut and minimal cut and fill of the slope to retain the natural terrain and gradient. The framework conceptualized by the very clever B.L. Manjunath mimics the structure of the trees with a narrow base that lightens and spreads as it moves up. Built over three levels to reduce the footprint and maximize views, maximize views the villa has been stilted off the ground to allow for the natural flow of water under the home. Localized stepped foundations along the slope allow for minimal excavation. To avoid the use of heavy machinery which would damage the slopes and trees, the structure is designed like a basket-like weave of lightweight steel tubes that use the composite strength of this lattice to meet the codal requirements. Each steel member can be carried manually by three to four people with pulleys, avoiding the use of cranes and heavy equipment. Thin deck slabs are welded to the framework as a structural member and also serve as scaffolding during the process of construction. The gap in the weave allows for a clean movement of services to maximize internal heights. The home is designed to achieve European passive house benchmarks, the first of its kind in the region. Passive design techniques address aspects of daylight, solar heat gain, natural ventilation, and thermal comfort. We have avoided the use of cement and kept wet work to minimum. The building skin is a highly insulated, multi-layered dry construction to achieve the desired U values, to regulate temperature and prevent heat loss. The result is that the home consumes less than 50% of the energy required to keep its residents warm indoors through winter compared to a traditional stone mortar house which is usually built in the hills. The material palette builds on the vocabulary of the Kumauni vernacular. Forest certified timber and locally sourced slate shingles weave through the metal structure to form an external rain screen. The interiors are a combination of the client's old classic furniture pieces that have been reused with new pieces that build a regional narrative through textiles, found objects, and art and craft. This is integrated within the relatively contemporary expression of the shell into an eclectic palette. This house has universal access. The ramped boardwalk 
leads through the trees to the main door. Wood carving is a popular craft in Kumauni culture, and local artisans handcrafted timber frames and the motif on the main door and the panels inside. The entry level consists of a foyer, powder room, living and dining with north and south decks. The kitchen and utility on the west face are serviced by an independent entry and service staircase. The door opens into a foyer space. To the left is the staircase that connects to the upper level and lower level of the home and an elevator to ensure universal access. The living room has two pockets of seating around a fireplace and seamlessly connects to a large semi-covered deck perched among the trees. The dining brings in the south sun through a glass conservatory that opens into a deck for outdoor dining. The upper level has a den with a deck flanked by two master bedrooms. The stairs open onto a den with a fireplace that connects to an open to sky balcony flanked on either side by bedrooms, each of which have cantilevered bay windows that project into the trees. Skylights with retractable blinds in all the rooms bring in winter sun and at night capture the intense starlit skies as one lies in bed. The lower level has a guest suite, staff quarters and a storage area. The staircase opens to the guest bedroom that has its own deck. There is also a connection to the beautiful semi-covered landscape underneath the house, which leads down through a cobbled mountain path to a bamboo deck over one of the springs that has come alive, revived post the ecological restoration. All the services of the home, such as the MEP room, heat pumps for the radiant underfloor heating system, are tucked in below the floating south court deck, easily accessible from the service staircase. The house within the forest evokes the feeling of being perched among the trees. The upper level bedrooms and deck nestled within the tree cover, the living room at level zero and the guest bedroom at level minus one with the ver verandas wrapped by the forest. The cantilevered projection bring the trees into the rooms. The east elevation of the house is gently perched on the slope, the south elevation of the house merging into the landscape. The original intent of having the house disappear within the tree cover. I have a short film that shows the experience of living in the house. Set between Jodhpur and Jaipur, this site is an oasis of 600 acres of regenerated desert forest flanked by a 150-year-old rainwater check dam. This was built by the then ruler as an irrigation reservoir for the vast farmlands in his control. The third generation of his descendants had been running it as a wildlife camp since 2005. In the 90s, interestingly, they stopped farming on the land and allowed for it to be overtaken by native trees into a wild forest and home to hundreds of species of migratory birds 
and wild animals such as deer and boar with the occasional leopard sighting. With temperatures in summer hitting over 45 degrees Celsius, the tented resort was seasonal from March to October and they were finding it difficult to sustain the business and the property. They leased out the property to new owners in 2019 who happened to be the same clients as Ras Jodhpur, whose goals were to increase the number and upgrade the tents, upgrade the public spaces and amenities with the aim of doubling the revenues from the rooms. For this, it was critical that they turn the seasonal camp into a perennial one and do it in a way that retained the lightness of built intervention and the connection to the site's unique setting. On the other side, we were dealing with temperatures varying from 46 degrees in summer to a chilling two degrees Celsius in winter. One had to keep in mind the fragile load-bearing capacity of the 150-year-old dam, and not the least, the business plan gave them only 10 minutes, uh, months from design to build. The old program had circulation and services already mapped out, and for minimum disruption, we decided to build upon the existing scheme. The old structures had no privacy either from the circulation path on the dam or the open areas in front, and only offered lake views ignoring the lush sunset forest views. The services were buried underground and were messy and difficult to maintain. Our primary move was to create tent-like, air-conditioned, insulated pods on an elevated lightweight deck with privacy screens separating and segregating them and a sunken circulation path on the west-facing forest. This allowed us to create strong lines of sight to the views on both sides and run services of the ground for easy maintenance. A skylight over the bed frames the intense star-studded night sky, heightened by the lack of ambient light in this remote area. The structural system works on shallow isolated pipe, piles made from hume pipes, precast and rammed with lime and waste stone from the region. Over this, a lightweight custom-built metal structure gets bolted, infill slabs of local sandstone form the deck and finished floor in a single gesture without the use of any cement or glue. A double-skin drywall thermally seals the structure and an outer covering of heat-reflecting tensile fabric completes both the waterproofing and the tent narrative. The continuous line of structures elevated off the ground allows us to maximize the number of rooms to 16, increase insulation and privacy, and ease out running all services as a single unit across the entire dam without having to excavate the sensitive topsoil. Needless to say, all rainwater is captured and wastewater recycled through biodigesters. The structures were built out within five months of hitting site. Month one, month two, month three, and month five. The master plan shows the entrance drop-off at number two, arrival courtyard around a restored step well at five, the old stairs branching off at either the boardwalk that leads to the tents at eight, or at the open courtyard that leads to the multifunctional restaurant bar that also serves as the restaurant, as a reception, at number six, which overlooks the pool and the deck at number seven. Number 13 is the back of house and kitchen, which overlooks the organic garden and farms at number four and has an independent service entrance. I'll talk about the guest pods now in a little more detail. The plan of the pod strongly extends the outdoor indoor connect with shaded verandas and open to sky gardens on both sides. When the dual sliding timber doors are open, it makes for a seamless connect from sunrise over the lake to sunset over the forest. This connect follows through in the bathrooms, which are linear thin slivers that capture the lake views from the bathtub and forest views from the WCs. The sunken boardwalk leads up the individual stairs to each tent that reveal a framed view of the lake. 
The interior scheme stays away from the traditional Rajasthan heritage cliche and instead chooses to focus on indigenous techniques reinterpreted to bridge the forest and wildlife narrative through the idiom of a camping tent. We collaborated with printmaker Dhvani Behel of Flora and Fauna in New Delhi, who reinterpreted classical Rajasthani miniature art forms and created a story around the indigenous flora and fauna. She took the folk tradition of small woodblock, woodblock printing and created large handcraft woodblocks, which are about two to two and a half meters long, to manually block print handloom fabric with each of these motifs, which change from tent to tent. This is further layered with hand embroidered birds and animals that are found on the property. This narrative appears in woodwork details, such as these hand carved air conditioning unit covers. All the furniture is custom designed and built in local oil, fished, uh, oil finished acacia, which is kikar wood, and builds on the romance of the handcrafted details of camping furniture of the old. These organic compositions come together to create happy surprises waiting to be discovered by guests as they use the space. Each tent is different in composition and colorway to create diverse moods for returning guests. This is the complete tent framing the forest view. This is the skylight over the bed, the tent framing the lake view, the lake facing veranda and bathtub as you step outside on the terrace and step down into the landscape. As you zoom out further into the lake, this is the colonnade of private decks from the lake and how they merge into the datum of the dam. And you can see the public space framed at the extreme right corner, that building in pink, which I'll talk about next. This is called the Baradari, derived from the traditional 12 pillared pavilion of Rajasthan, which literally means a gathering space. Perched on the edge of the dam, the spaces follow a similar hierarchy as the tents, with wraparound shaded verandas overlooking the lake on one side and the pool deck and pool on the other. The inner space of the building is designed with double doors that fold into the finely detailed sandstone fins for six months of the year when the whole building functions like an open, naturally ventilated pavilion. This building is a custom-built metal framework that holds two slabs of local chitar sandstone with insulation in between, again, without the use of cement or glue. The roof is made with sandstone slabs, just like traditional roofs were, with waterproofing in lime mortar sourced from neighboring quarries. All surfaces within the reach of guests are hand-dressed stone and all details, including air conditioning grills used a hand cut at sight by local artisans. This is the view of the building from a boat on the lake, showing the connection of the veranda to the interior. The east facing veranda facing the lake, the south elevation and the courtyard where the sunbeds are set up in winter and campfires in the evening as the building becomes a lantern on the dam. Internally, the stone slabs are assembled to create an air conditioning duct that wraps around the interior without being visible. While graphically, the interior scheme takes forward the forest narrative, which is hand chiseled onto the sandstone slabs used. The multifunctional buffet come island counter that anchors the space is hand carved with flamingos that come to nest by the lake in winter. The west veranda overlooks the sundowner pool deck with the pavilion lighting up over the pool as the sun sets. This is framed by the reclaimed stone rubble masonry of the back of house building, which has the kitchen that connects below to the entrance, a traditional step well framing a small ancient shrine that houses the original deity 
that guards the dam, which we saved throughout the process. To keep the camp alive and interactive, there are several elements built into the design that need to be maintained by the women from the neighboring village as a daily ritual, such as the clay line courtyards, the lime powder decorations within these, and the clay and lime hand-painted signages for the rooms that need to be redone regularly as they fade away. The film here that captures the experience. That's all I have for today.